Hi there and welcome to the last video in chapter 12 where we discuss joint algorithms in relational database systems. Now that we have a pretty good grip of joint algorithms in PostgreSQL, let's invest this video in the discussion of joins in MonetDB in this main memory database system. There are some new ideas that will pop up, some ideas that are motivated by observations again of how modern CPUs and the RAM architecture of modern systems operate. And this influences the construction of join algorithms that uh, prove to be efficient in systems like MoneyDB. All right, so uh, let's look at the playground query Q11 again, exactly the query that we have already discussed while we were focusing on PostgreSQL. So again, we would have one and many tables and we would discuss uh, equijoins here on the A columns of these one and many tables. So our discussion here will focus on equijoins. We will not consider general theta joins in the context of this DB2 course this semester. All right, uh, we construct the results from columns B, as you see here. So the join columns would be A, but the result that you would like to see is actually the B columns of both contributing tables. That will have an impact on the plan that is generated for this particular query. Okay, right. So uh, what you will notice is that the modern main memory based database systems are really hash join focused and for a good reason probably because these systems are built under the uh, assumption that they are located on hosts that have plenty of RAM available. We are talking about main memory database systems. So we are operating on systems that have large working memory, much larger than the working memory that we will probably allocate for our traditional disk-based database systems. Uh, large available working memory, large RAM resident working memory, will of course enable large hash tables so that hash joins and hash join algorithms uh, become really attractive in this particular context. So that's the reason why hash join really is the predominant hash a join method in such uh, modern main memory based database systems. Of course, there is an intrinsic order on the on the rows of the participating buts in the context of MoneyDB. And if that order should coincide with the join order here, well, with the join columns that are uh, participating in the join predicates, well, then of course, merge join also is one viable alternative. And indeed, you find that implemented in memory memory database systems. But for the coming minutes, let's focus on hash-based join algorithms. Okay, what you will find is that the result of such a join computation inside MoneyDB will be a so-called or a pair of so-called join index buts. Join index buts that we can then later use to select the correct rows from other columns that were not mentioned in the join predicate, for example, from the B columns here, all right? So we will compute the join index bus, buts based on the A columns, right? And then we'll you later use the join index buts to collect the correct rows from both participating tables to form the correct result joint pairs. This is much like the idea of using selection vectors when we implemented filtering or select the selection operation in uh, MoneyDB. The output of such a selection operation has been a selection vector which we then could apply to all other columns of the filter table to restrict these columns to only those rows that have qualified regarding the predicate. And a very similar idea is behind these join index buts. Okay, so let's have a look at how this could work. This could be such a join setup. I think it's best to read this diagram from left to right. Okay, right, so what we start with is of course our input buts, those tables 
that are uh, to be joined. And uh, again, that will be the one and the many table. In our playground setup, both of these tables have two columns, the A and B columns. And of course, both of these are represented in separate butts, in the A butts and in the B butts. And of course, both share one head column or they have the same head column that is in sync in both butts so that both together can represent a multicolon table. Everything as before. If we perform a join between these two tables, well, then there would be an equi join between these two tables. Then there would be two butts, namely the A butts here, this A butt and this A butt that define the join predicate. Okay, so in our case, it will be both A butts of the one and many table that will define the join predicate. And as you can see, indeed, these two A butts are the arguments, the first arguments that will be feed into the mal operator algebra.join. This is our equijoin operator that is placed inside the family of mal operation. It's exactly this operator that we will use to compute the join index buts. All right, so this is a binary operator that consumes two buts and it will also generate two buts, two join index buts. One join index but that will be associated with the one table, one join index but that will be associated with the many table. All right, so uh, as you can see, both of these join index buts in this particular example contain six rows, but this is a general rule the two generated join index buts have the same number of rows. Exactly that many rows will be seen in the overall join result. So in this case, six rows will make up the join result of this join between the one and many tables. Which rows are participating in this join result? Well, the join index will tell us. The first, the first row in the join result will uh, be built from the row at offset four in the one table okay offset four in the one table that this this is this particular row and from offset well it's also four in the many table all right so offset four in the many table that's this particular row so here the a value is zero and here the a value indeed is zero they would indeed form an equi-join pair in an A-based join. Looks good to me. Okay, so let's look at uh, another join pair result. So the second entry or the second result in our join result would be formed by the seventh row of the one table and the zeroth row of the many table. This is how to read these join index buts. So let's check. The, zero, uh, the seventh row of the one table, okay, a value five, and the zeroth row of the many table, a value five, again, these form a proper joint pair. Looks good to me. And one final look, maybe, well, you see that the row at offset seven in the one table uh, occurs twice here in this joint index, which indicates that it has more than one, in this case, two joint partners on the many side. Well, this is a one to n relationship, a one to many join. Okay, so uh, well, okay, we know that the row at uh, in the one table at position seven has the a value five, and it will join with this uh, the row at offset one in the many table, and indeed it also has offset five. Well, these form another joint pair. So this is how to read these join index buts. They define the join partners in each of the participating tables. To construct the final join result now would be uh, just a matter of applying algebra projection, an old idea that we've seen so many times already in the implementation of SQL plans inside MoneyDB. All right, so we would use the join index, but just like we would use a selection vector and feed it into algebra projection on the B column of our one but. And we would use this join index, but and feed it into an algebra projection on the B column of the many but. Okay, von 
from both of these, we could generate the overall join result, which of course has, has six rows. And uh, as you can see, indeed, the correct B values have been uh, collected to form join pairs. All right, so that's the basic idea of join processing inside MonetDB. Let's quickly switch over to the live MonetDB terminal and uh, let's see that we can find these general concepts and ideas over there in the real system. All right, so what I've done already here is to uh, create the one and many tables, okay? So uh, both are two column tables and uh, well, A is the primary key in this particular case. Uh, well, uh, for the one table, of course, uh, there is uh, repeating A values possibly on the many side. This is a one to N join. Okay, and then we have uh, insert statement that define table instances that coincide what, with what you have seen on the slides. Okay, so that would be the one table. Here's the many table. I've already populated these and prepared this experiment for you. So what we could do now is to just run the ProQuery Q11 here. It's just the equi-join on the one and many tables. Let's do that. All right, so six tuples, six rows, as expected, as described on the slide that we have just seen. And well, the correctness of the join result is uh, suggested that by these lower and uppercase characters that uh, have been joined together. This uh, is an indication of, of the, the uh, for the the correct evaluation of the join, but of course what we are more interested in is a look at the plan, the mal plan that is generated for this particular query. So let's add the explain prefix here and run again. So what we see again is the mal output, the expected mal output. Let's scroll to the top of the mal program here. And let's see whether we can see structure there that is expected. All right, so um, well, we would look at with these three uh, statements, we would access the A column of the one table. Uh, and as you can see, well, this X17 here, that would be the final but that represents the A column of the one table with visibility information applied everything ready to go. The same happens in the following three mile statements. And uh, well, X32 is the but that represents the A column of the many table. So X17 and X32, these are indeed fed into the algebra join operation that we've just mentioned. Okay, so there is uh, there's a few more non but arguments here. Well, these are two arguments that are so called candidate vector buts, which would allow us to subset the buts that we have just uh, that we have just fed into here. So we could omit particular rows from participating in the joint, but uh, well, not in this particular case in this particular simple query, then we can have Boolean flex here that determine whether this is an outer join or a regular inner join. So the false bit here would say that we are not computing an outer join. This is a regular inner join. So rows without a join partner would be omitted from the join result. And uh, well, if we have clever insights in the size, the expected size of the join result, which was six in our example, then we could tell algebra join with this optional parameter here and uh, indicate to the system we expect a join result size of that many rows. No such information available to us, for uh, so algebra join has to do without, and we just pass along nil here. Right, so what we get out of this, of algebra join, is two result tables, okay? And uh, x39 and x40, these are two buts of OIDs that have OIDs in their tails, these are the join index buts. Well, uh, to construct the final result, let's access the B column on the many side and then apply two buts, two OID buts, the join, the visibility but C25 and the join index but for the left hand, for the uh, right hand side, I'm sorry, that would be X40. And just do the same with the B column on the one side, apply visibility information 
and also apply the join index but for the left hand side and that leaves us with the final with the final columns x48 and x46 two string buts indeed two string buts is what we expected the lowercase and uppercase characters that we've seen in the overall result and from these we will build the final result well all of this is uh, reading really messy uh, and it's, it's hard to uh, hard to grasp so what i've done here as usual when we are talking about such uh, such important mal plans i brought a variant of that mal plan with me that only contains the extra the really core logic of what makes uh, up this this join operation so uh, let's quickly have a look at that quit the sql session and reopen a mal session here there we go all right so let's replay this equi join mal plan here um, uh, with some proper documentation and naming of buts so initialize the sql system then access the a column of the one but with all the visibility information applied so that would be the a column of the one but do that access the a column of the many but do that all right and then perform the algebra join as you can see we feed in the two a columns of participating buts no candidate buts no subsetting here no outer join semantics no information about the expected result size all right so let's do this we end up with two join index buts, the left and right join index buts. If we print these together and have a look at them, they will contain six rows, just like the overall join result. Okay, so these are the six rows. And uh, we can see that we can already see the join pairs indicated by their offsets in the left-hand side, the one, and the right-hand side, the many tables. So the third row of the one table and the fifth row of the many table will form a join pair. And we see that the third row of the one table will indeed also join with the third row of the many table. So this is a true one to many join that we've computed here. So the left and right join index buts is all we need to construct the overall result. And that's what we are preparing here. We uh, access the B columns of both participating tables. And then, well, we perform visibility uh, information projection and then join index projection. And what we end up is the two columns B1 and B2 here that make up the final result. Let's print them and see the overall result here. Oh, there you go. This is how it, um, joins are being computed using join index buts. Uh, if our result, if the resulting table would have more than just two columns, uh, no problem. We would just use the left join index and the right join index as, as needed and apply them to the input tables to, to form the correct, probably very wide join result that we need to construct. Okay, so, all right, so there's industrial loan mowing going on again outside my window. Let me close the window. I will be back in a second. Really so annoying. All right, there we are. Okay, so uh, I think that completes our mal example here. So uh, let's switch back to the slides because there is one aspect that we need to address when we compute such hash-based joins inside MoneyDB. So, uh, well, we, we talked about that uh, hash-based joins are the go-to method in main memory-based systems like MoneyDB. Um, and indeed, if you look at the internals at the implementation of algebra join, then you will see that, uh, well, there is, of course, different tactics implemented to implement algebra join in MoneyDB, but the predominant tactic would be hash-based. All right. And if we look more closely at that, then we will see a problem. Right. So uh, to perform such a hash join, of course, we will need to create a hash table. So a hash table with several buckets uh, just like we have discussed 
described and used in our hash-based implementations of joins in PostgreSQL. So that would be this particular hash table, right? Uh, we would scan we would scan the uh, the participating tables uh, from top to bottom here and uh, use their key values the key values in the tail columns of the participating butts uh, apply a hash function to those key values and then uh, compute the hash bucket into which one particular row for example this particular row has to be placed so that's the meaning of these arrows here. We will be let into the K2 bucket for this particular row. And for the next row, we will be let into the KN bucket. And for the next row, we will probably let into the K2 bucket again, and so on and so on. All right. So what you see is while we perform a sequential scan here on the input button, the writes into these hash buckets, they will be essentially random. We will write into K1, we will write into K3 there, then we write into K1 again, then we write into Kn. How to predict, it's actually uh, um, a virtue of the hash function that it distributes all the keys across the entire hash buckets and that there is no skewing going on. So we can expect in a, in a setup where the hash function is worth its money. We can expect all of these n buckets to receive writes. Okay, uh, well, so that is indeed main memory writes into n different memory locations, and there's a problem here. If n is really large, if n is really substantially large, like uh, many thousand buckets, for example, uh, then what we will see is that we see writes into more than thousands, thousands of different memory locations inside a very tight loop. The very tight loop that scans all the values from the participating tail column here and then distributes them into the hash buckets. This very tight loop will write to uh, quite a number, n, the number is n, of different memory locations. And that, of course, would demand that all of these different buckets find a place in the CPU cache. And this may easily exceed the cache size or the number of cache lines that the CPU can provide to us. All right, so what we will see is uh, cache threshing if we are unlucky. So uh, some of these buckets may be uh, located inside the cache, but uh, this bucket may have to be evicted because we now have to write into hash bucket KN only to find that the next key that we are hashing in the tail column then has to go into bucket K1 again. So it better be present in the cache. So some other bucket has to be replaced, maybe K3. So you will see a constant bringing in and then evicting again of different memory regions, the hash buckets, into the CPU cache. And that, of course, uh, hurts performance. There's also a different issue, the so-called transaction look-aside buffer. So in a modern, uh, in a modern uh, uh, RAM architecture, memory architecture, and modern CPUs, well, we address virtual memory locations, virtual memory locations that the CPU and its so-called transaction look-aside buffer has to re rewrite and transform into real physical memory locations. Okay, so writes to all of these buckets require is require us to 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 transform the virtual memory location of bucket KN for example to its real physical memory location and there is quite the number of such translations that we have to perform and then have to remember the TLB, the transaction lookaside buffer, uh, makes an effort to re remember the most recent translations from virtual to physical memory locations so that we don't have to redo these over and over again. But the TLB is just another cache with limited resources and limited size. If there are too many entries, too many buckets, that we have to write to and whose addresses we have to remember, well, then uh, the, the recent translations for some mem address translations for some of these buckets might have been evicted from the TB again. 
uh, already. So we have to redo the translation and place that uh, re translated uh, virtual memory location and its physical address into the TLB again, probably at the cost of evicting some other entries in the TLB. So there is not only cache thrashing regarding the data, but also regarding the addresses of these buckets. So it's a double cache threshing problem that we may face here. All right. One way out of this conundrum may be to reduce the number of buckets to reduce n that we have to consider at any one time. So if n is too large, uh, because we need too many buckets to store all of these uh, all of these key values inside the appropriate locations here in the hash table, then it might be uh, worthwhile to, uh, well, to reduce that particular number of buckets that will lead to a high number of buckets being present in the CPU data cache and the high number of TLB entries for memory and address translation. All right, and that observation and that idea leads to the idea of Radix clustering. All right, in Radix clustering, we try to uh, to partition, to cluster, to assign values to particular buckets, but do so in a step by step, in a round by round fashion, and uh, uh, in an effort to not overwhelm the CPU data cache and the TLB. So, um, if we have a number of tail values here, okay that we have to distribute into hash buckets, then uh, what we will do is only consider a few bits, only consider B bits, B bits of these, uh, of these tail values, or indeed of the hash function of these tail values. So what you will see here is the actual tail values. What you see here just next to the table is three bits, three bits of the hash value for these particular for these particular key values. To make the uh, demonstration on this slide simple and uh, approachable, what I've done here is used a hash function that is just the identity, the identity on these values, on these key values here. So the hash value for the key value 57 will be 57. What you see here are the lower most, the, the lower three bits of value 57, the lower three bits of value 17. All right, so this is for explanation purposes. Normally, you would see the lower B bits in general of the hash value for these tail values. All right, so uh, since these are three bits and all of these bits, of course, could be cleared or set independently, well, that would lead to two to the power of three, well, eight different buckets that we would need to address um, uh, when we distribute all the entries here. Okay, uh, let's assume that eight buckets would thrash, would overwhelm our data cache and our TLB. So what we can do is we can, instead of distributing these values based on the value of all three bits here, let's uh, be... Uh, more conservative and only co uh, distribute the values on the first two leading bits, on the first two leading bits. The first two leading bits here will only take on four, two to the power of two, four different bit combinations. All right, so uh, just looking at the first two leading bits here of the of the hash values, we would distribute our, our rows into four buckets, not eight. And let's assume that four buckets is okay from the viewpoint of the TLB. And that's what we are doing here. So uh, in the first path where we look at two bits, right, this is this B1 here, we look at two bits, we will distribute into four different buckets, the 0, 0 bucket, the 0, 1 bucket, the 1, 0 bucket, and the 1, 1 bucket. And as you can see, uh, well, the tail values in this column have been distributed based on the first two leading bits in their appropriate hash buckets here. All right, so that would be the first phase of radix clustering or radix partitioning. Okay, 
Now in the next phase, uh, because we have to consider three bits, we only consider two bits so far. In the next phase, we will consider the lowermost bit here, only this rightmost bit. Okay, considering only this particular bit for all of the entries here will lead to a partitioning into two buckets per input bucket. So while we scan this 0, 0 bucket, its entries will be distributed in two further buckets. All right, so we see that, uh, well, these are these two further buckets. Uh, almost all of the entries in this particular example of the 0, 0 bucket here, well, all of, almost all of them le uh, were um, written into the 0, 0, 001 bucket. Only one entry was placed in the 0, 0, 0 bucket. Okay, but the uh, important observation is that in this particular phase, we have only two different bucket locations that we will write to, and this will not overwhelm our TLB. Right. In this particular case, we had four buckets that we would write to. Okay, there's this already. No. Okay, and this also would not overwhelm our TLB. Taken together, well, we would distribute taken together looking f at this input and this final output. We have distributed into uh, eight buckets, finally. But, uh, well, at no point in time, at no phase, we were overwhelming our TAB or data cache uh, resources. We only have to make sure that the number of bits by which we distribute in each of these phases add up to the number of bits that we need overall to consider the uh, distribution regarding the hash key. So if B is 3, then 2 plus 1 will uh, add up to the overall 3 bits that we would like to consider. Right. The number of buckets, of course, is uh, is the overall number of buckets that we create is this number, and uh, well, it's exactly the number that we were um, aiming for, namely eight buckets in this particular example. Okay, so that would be the idea of Radix clustering, uh, partitioning into many buckets, but in phases to avoid TLB and cache thrashing, and how this fits with the overall join algorithm idea is shown here on the last slide of this slide set. All right, so, uh, well, again, read this slide from left to right. Okay, so these would be the two input, but the two join buts in a sense. They both carry in their tail values, the A values that we will use in the join predicate. Please uh, uh, note that I have swap the order of the head and the tail column in this particular but only to have the tail values that are being compared to have them next to each other all right so uh, well we will perform two pass radix clustering here so the number of passes will be two and in each of these paths just to keep the example uh, simple and have it fit on one slide in each of these passes we will only consider one bit and again, the hash function will be the identity, all right? So indeed, this the hash value for this A value will be three. So we know the bits, we know the bits of the hash values for all of these keys. We would just look at the bits of the A values themselves. So in the first path, that would be the first path, we would distribute on, uh, on a single bit here, on a single bit, right? Uh, and this leads to a distribution of uh, the r values in this particular but into two buckets. We are considering only one bit. And the distribution of these values in, of course, two buckets. All right, this would not overwhelm the TLB, we hope. Okay, uh, in the next phase, well, we would consider the rightmost bit. Okay, and thus, refine the bucket distribution of the rows to finally uh, to finally have a distribution into four buckets and the same of course happens for the rightmost input but here okay so now we have a distribution of rows into four buckets in each of the participating tables all right what we would need to perform now is 
partition local joins and these I have indicated uh, between the two the two buckets that we have created here so now what we would perform would be a partitioned local operation let me highlight this maybe with a yeah so we would only consider the data that is placed in the associated 00, zero bits buckets here and would perform a join a local join between the entries that have been placed in these buckets the uh, assumption is that we would probably can perform a simple nested loop join between these uh, between the entries in this in these in these buckets here and of course we are operating under the hope that such a local join a cluster or bucket local join would be uh, considering only so few rows that all of these fit into the CPU cache so if indeed if we perform a nested loops join here we could hope for or the rows of the outer of the outer bucket to be present in the data cache all the time okay uh, in this case we would have four four such cluster or bucket local joins that have to be performed of course these could be performed in parallel what we end up with is the result of all of this joining and that would be the join indices in the form that you uh, already know okay so uh, that would be the idea of a hash based join algorithm that is aware of the resource constraints the data cache and the TLB constraints in modern CPUs uh, so it would lead to a phase based approach in which each of the phases considers only so many bits that the distribution into a number of buckets is performed that does not overwhelm the resources of the participating data and address caches okay I think this completes our discussion of join algorithms in PostgreSQL and MoneyDB this was chapter 12 one of the larger chapters in the DB2 course uh, there's only two more chapters to go chapter 13 will be about plan evaluation how to orchestrate the, a large a potentially large number of uh, of operators in complex plans so that data flows from operator to operator in an efficient manner not to overwhelm the uh, the memory uh, the working memory of the system uh, while you do so i think that could be very interesting and uh, binds and ties together all the individual operators that we have talked about so far it ties them together to form complex large plans that can uh, evaluate complex sql queries all right and the last chapter will talk about query optimization how to arrive at good query plans that well that uh, move move less data evaluate most efficiently and uh, well take into account the presence of indices interesting orders and so on all of this is um, a very nice way to finalize our discussion in this db2 course i really do hope that you will stick around for these two final chapters in this semester uh, see you then take care and uh, have a good time bye bye